Hi, I'm Amy Gershkoff Bowles, and I'm so excited to be part of Data.World's first ever summit. And I'm only just so disappointed that it's virtual and I won't get to meet all of you in person, but I'm wishing you all a wonderful summit and really excited to be a part of this. And I'm especially excited that the other speaker is DJ, uh, a fellow Obama alum. So um, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, five lessons that I've learned in my tour of duty as a chief data officer uh, at several different companies. I've been the chief data officer at uh, Zynga, at Ancestry.com, and now at Bitly. Um, and I worked for the chief data officer at eBay. So I've had uh, quite a bit of experience uh, in the data department. And I've learned a few things along the way that I hope can be helpful to all of you in your journey uh, to make your organizations more data-driven and to have data be impactful on uh, revenue, costs, innovation, and many other aspects of your organization. So a key part of most data teams um, is uh, data science analytics. And one of the things that I've noticed in my time as a chief data officer uh, is that many people think of data and data science as a strategy of last resort. Uh, you know, the revenues are trending down or costs are trending up. The margin isn't what Wall Street or the investors were hoping for. And so all of a sudden, uh, people think, oh, let's definitely hire some data scientists or hire a chief data officer or bring in a bunch of new people on the analytics team. And the challenge with this strategy is that uh, data is never supposed to be a strategy of last resort. It requires uh, ongoing investment uh, really for a prolonged period of time before you're going to see the kinds of results um, that companies are looking for when they decide to invest in a data team. Um, and it requires sustained investment in infrastructure as well as in people. And all of that takes time. So if you're thinking of a data team or a data science team as a quick fix uh, to a series of business challenges, um, generally speaking, companies that go that route are uh, not uh, going to see the results that they're expecting. But I've also seen um, other organizations uh, think of data science as a silver bullet that will solve you know, all of their problems. We bring in a data team, all of our metrics will go up and to the right. Um, and the truth is uh, a data, a great data team or a data science team, it's not a substitute for product market fit. It's not a substitute for uh, great marketing. It's not a substitute for a compelling brand. Um, all of those are critically important factors. Um, and then data can enhance all of those areas. So data, uh, once you have a great product, great marketing, great brand, um, you know, at excellence uh, delivery in all of these other major areas, uh, you could think of data and data science as ways to um, make incremental gains in revenue and reducing costs in um, improving margin, uh, but they're not a substitute for nailing the fundamentals. So it's always important to really focus on the fundamentals of your business first, and think of data as an enhancement uh, once that foundation has been laid. So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, five key components that I've seen, um, each of which are uh, necessary but not sufficient. All of them together, frankly, are necessary but not sufficient um, for a really successful data organization. Uh, but there are five that I've seen pretty consistently in both the organizations I've been a part of and ones that I've advised um, and uh, helped in, and, uh, in other ways. Um, all, all of them uh, are, are kind of key components. And I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit of detail. Uh, the first one is aligning on organizational structures. Uh, so thinking about where data science fits uh, within the organization, where the data team fits within the organization is critically important. Uh, the second is to invest in HR to make sure you're, uh, you know, hiring the right recruiters to bring in the right kind of talent. Um, third is investing in a robust infrastructure. Uh, critically important to getting the most out of a data team is having a data infrastructure that's going to be optimal uh, for them to have those successes. Uh, fourth, um, it, but super important, is to figure out what your one KPI is that you're actually benchmarking your team against. Um, and that sounds simple, but it's actually um, very challenging for many organizations. Um, and last one is around managing expectations with stakeholders around the organization as to the impact that they can see from a data or data science team. All right, so let's talk about each of these in detail. Um, first is on organizational structure. So figuring out where the data team sits. Um, in uh, my uh, chief data officer roles, I have reported directly to the chief 
executive officer, the CEO of the company. Um, but uh, many people um, that I know who are chief data officers at other organizations report in lots of other places. Um, the CIO or the CTO's office <laughs> and the CFO in many other places. And so um, before thinking about where the data science or data team should fit, um, first, it's most important to actually think about what success looks like for the team. Um, is, the, is the data team that you're building uh, really meant to drive revenue, reduce costs? Um, is it about R&D or is it about revenue today? Um, or is this about sort of uh, making your brand uh, one uh, that is talked about as sort of leading edge because you're hiring AI experts and machine learning experts? Um, or is it about improving efficiency and operations? All of these um, and the many others that listed here are, are possible goals for the data team. Um, but not all of them can be achieved simultaneously. So um, it's really important to think about what are the one or two um, uh, you know, goals that, that uh, really the organization has for the data team. And then you can then think about where the data team should be situated in the organization on the basis of um, what the goal is you're trying to achieve. So for example, um, if you're hoping that the data team will generate a lot of top line revenue, then situating them in the office of the CFO, which is generally about reducing costs, um, might represent a misalignment uh, between, um, you know, what, uh, you know, the goal of the team is and where they're situated. Uh, or similarly, sometimes uh, data teams are situated in the product or technology organization, but then they're expected to deliver big wins for the marketing team. Um, and that's very challenging if they're situated in the product organization. So it's really important um, to think about uh, where, uh, what the goals of the team are, what success looks like, and then think about where to situate them in the organization on the basis of alignment with those goals. It's super important to setting the team up for optimal success. So second is to invest in HR. And it might sound a bit uh, counterintuitive for me um, to talk about building the best data team and uh, that you need to actually be investing in human resources. But human resources is a critically important function in pretty much every company, and um, they're often really underinvested in. And it's really important if you're trying to recruit a great data team, a great data science team, a great data analytics team, uh, the recruiters are the first people that potential employees have contact with um, in your organization. So the very first interaction that a potential employee for your team uh, your data team has with your, your company is with those recruiters. And yet often recruiting is a very underinvested in function at lots of companies, um, big and small. Um, and so I really recommend um, if you're trying to build a data science team, for example, to invest in recruiters that actually specialize in recruiting data science talent or, or data analytics talent um, or data talent. Um, rather than just sort of generalized recruiters who have worked in sort of lots of areas. These type of specialist recruiters always cost more. But this is a situation where it has been my experience, having collected a lot of data, working with a number of different recruiters at many different companies over the last uh, almost two decades, is that, you know, you get what you pay for. And so if you're investing in recruiters with that deep bench strength in recruiting this type of talent specifically, you're going to get better talent in the door. And having better talent in the door is going to help your team be more successful. And it's also really important to understand the factors that high quality candidates are going to actually care about. Um, so it's not enough to just have a background in, um, oh, I've hired a lot of data scientists or I've hired a lot of data analysts, but it's someone who has um, a little bit of uh, depth around what are the factors that matter to data scientists. So, for example, uh, high quality candidates um, for a data science role or data analytics role are typically going to ask you questions about your technology stack. Uh, recruiters uh, don't need to be as deep as the head of engineering or anything like that, but they ought to be able to answer some very basic questions around how much data do we have? Is it structured or unstructured? Um, what's the kind of environment um, that data scientists have to work in? Um, you know, a little bit about the tech stack. Are you an AWS company, a Microsoft Azure company, a GCP company, um, or are you still using on-prem servers and haven't started your journey to the cloud yet? These are all really um, basic questions that uh, any recruiter who's recruiting for your data team should be able to answer. And you want recruiters who know how to draw a diverse slate of candidates. 
Diversity has always, always, always been mission critical, um, but it's more important now than ever before. And uh, the best recruiters will know how to draw a diverse slate of candidates. It's diverse on many different dimensions, um, and that's going to give you access to the best talent. So it's really important to invest in the right recruiters. So I'll give you some examples of where this has gone very wrong is um, if you uh, take a look here, I've gotten a number of uh, LinkedIn uh, in-mails. These are real LinkedIn in-mails that I have received over the years uh, from people um, trying to recruit me for um, various data science leadership roles. Um, and um, this is just a few examples of um, how uh, hiring the wrong recruiters can really um, you know, put a bad best a bad foot forward for your company. Um, so uh, at least once a week, I get a recruiter who gets my name wrong. Um, I'm obviously not Gina, as you can see in the upper left. Uh, says my name pretty uh, prominently on my LinkedIn profile, and these are all real LinkedIn in, in mails that that I've received. Um, I also uh, the one in the lower left. Um, it has no useful information about the company or the role. It just says we're looking for a data scientist. Um, that was one I got a few years ago, um, but I get these types of uh, in mails uh, quite frequently, um, and that's an example of uh, investing in the wrong recruiters. Um, I also frequently get emails from recruiters that don't make any sense. So I highlighted here a track record of scaling engineering organizations that evaluate data quality. Um, that doesn't that doesn't actually make sense. Is it a is it a data quality organization? Is it an analytic organization? Is it an engineering organization? Um, and occasionally, uh, people will send just a, a photo, um, which is um, sort of uh, not appropriate, but also um, uh, not telling me anything about the company, the role, the type of data, or anything that I might be interested in if I'm a high quality candidate. So this is an example of this is the first interaction that I had with each of these four companies, um, and it didn't uh, wasn't particularly positive, as you might imagine. Um, and I have um, hundreds more examples as well. So invest in the right recruiters. It really does matter. Um, in, and you want the best talent for your team. OK, so uh, you've got the right recruiters. You're hiring the right people, drawing from a diverse slate of candidates in that process. Um, so all that's going well. You've situated the team in the right place in the organization. Um, it's next really important to make sure that you have robust infrastructure. Um, I cannot tell you how many times either I or a peer of mine have stepped into what sounded like an incredibly exciting role at a company, um, either uh, leading a data team, a data science team, leading a data organization, um, only to find that the data infrastructure um, had uh, such problems that um, I, I or my peers um, spent most of uh, my time in the role uh, doing what I call data janitorial work. Um, doing the cleanup to make the infrastructure work, um, which is a necessary um, uh, prerequisite for actually doing any interesting uh, data science um, on top of that data and infrastructure. And so if you're hiring really great talent, really great data science talent, really great data talent, really great analytics talent, um, you want to bring them in and have uh, already done the data janitorial work to make sure that they have an infrastructure that they can hit the ground running in. Um, and not have to spend multiple years uh, cleaning up tech debt uh, and making the infrastructure usable for a data or data scientist. Um, so there's just some really basic pieces here that you have to get right. Um, so for example, um, if your infrastructure has problems um, with uh, just uptime uh, or um, you know, failures on you know, basic ETL processes, um, or you don't have a regular process for QAing your data, or your data is siloed in some cloud spaces and some on-prem servers, um, none of it's connected, and then your data scientist is gonna spend possibly years knitting the data together rather than building amazing machine learning models or applying AI to hard business problems. Um, so uh, today, a few of the basics are uh, definitely connecting all the data that you have about your customers in a way that makes it accessible and usable uh, for data analysts and data scientists. Um, you want uh, to have invested in regularly QAing and maintaining your data. Um, data are ever-changing, ever-growing, and they're mo for most organizations, they're your largest durable, non-depletable asset. And that means you should invest in keeping it clean, maintained, uh, and up-to-date. Uh, and that, that does require dedicated, uh, usually staff and uh, investment uh, on the infrastructure side, and it's critically, critically important. Um, you want to make sure that you've uh, solved problems like uh, defining what is a customer. That might sound simple, but if I buy something and then return it, am I still a customer? Um, uh, what if I, um, you know, uh, take a company like 
at eBay where I used to work? What if I sold something, but I never bought anything? Am I a customer? Um, these are questions that don't have wrong answers, um, but it is important that everyone in the company be on the same page. Um, if you're a, a company that operates globally, um, how you think about uh, counting revenue, whether you uh, take foreign currencies into account um, and how you do that, um, all of that is, um, again, there's uh, not really wrong answers, but it's important everyone in the organization uh, count the pennies in the same way. Um, because what you want to do is be able to then have conversations within the organization about how data can enhance and move forward key initiatives rather than having basic foundational definitional conversations. Um, and today, most companies, a real-time streaming data environment is, is, is uh, table stakes. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, real-time streaming environment uh, was a bit more of a luxury. And today, it's really table stakes. Uh, the world is changing very rapidly, especially now in 2020. Um, and everyone needs uh, the ability to um, get access to the latest data without days of latency while cumbersome ETL processes run um, or databases are updated slowly. Um, no, no, the world in 2020 doesn't operate that way. Um, so you want mechanisms for leveraging streaming data, for a data discovery pipeline, um, for easily productionalizing data science models once uh, they're developed. Um, and last, I'd be remiss, of course, because this is Data.World Summit, of I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, that you probably also want to think about a cloud-native data catalog. And uh, I think Data.World might be the company to talk to if that's something um, that you're considering for your infrastructure. Okay, so uh, fourth is to decide on one KPI. And since my fellow speaker for this event um, is DJ, who is a fellow Obama alum, I thought I would use an example from my D's on the Obama campaign where I was head of uh, media and analytics. And so one of the things that the Obama campaign did really well, um, President Obama's reelection campaign, um, was that we aligned very early on on one KPI. Um, so if the election were held today, would President Obama win or lose? Now, that sounds very simple. Like, of course, that should be your KPI. But let me tell you, in the 2008 campaign, there were actually dozens of KPIs, and each department on the campaign used a different one. Uh, so maybe the department that's, uh, you know, doing a lot of digital advertising might look at the click-through rate on ads. Uh, the TV buying department might look at TV impressions. Um, the people in charge of the field operation would look at doors knocked or uh, volunteers recruited or people, um, phone calls made. Uh, maybe the person in charge of events looks at attendance at rallies. Um, the people in charge of fundraising look at how much money was raised. And those are all very different KPIs. And I've got several more on here. And you can think of hundreds more, actually. Um, and so um, and the President Obama's uh, campaign in 2008 is not that different than most Fortune 1000 companies in America today. Uh, where many of them have different departments with different goals. And when you have different departments with different goals, you can't all work together as effectively as if you're all working in a laser-focused way towards the same goals. So in my time at eBay, at Zynga, uh, Ancestry, um, I really focused on trying to align the organization around a smaller number of KPIs, and if possible, just one. And so at eBay, for example, um, when I did the media planning and buying for our global brand campaign, um, there are lots of different ways that you could think about a global brand campaign having an impact on a business. Um, but I said, we need to pick one. Um, so you could think about you know, revenue, you could think about site visits, you could think about purchases made, you could think about opinion of the brand, aided or unaided awareness. There are dozens of KPIs you could think about. But I said it was really important for us to pick one because then as a team, we'd be much more aligned. And so that kind of thinking around one KPI is extremely important. Um, again, uh, as another example, when I was at Zynga um, and we would do uh, different data science, uh, produce different data science models on my team to support the different game studios. Um, if, if we were asked for a model, for example, to help with retention um, in a game, let's say, um, it, you know, it would be an important question to ask, is that retention uh, model meant to be used um, you know, to uh, right before uh, the, the last time you'll see a player? Or is that retention model meant to be used uh, to try to gain somebody back? Um, what's the goal of this model? And it's important for the whole team to be aligned around one goal. Um, and whether it's for a project or across the entire organization, that alignment is incredibly important. So deciding on one KPI um, for um, your entire team 
uh, for a specific project, um, it's all very important because there's often many different ways that data analytics and data science uh, can move the needle for an organization, but deciding on one is, is always an important step. <laughs> Last but not least um, is managing expectations. And so one of the things that I've learned over the course of my career, and this is probably something that um, I feel like I have uh, made, the, made the largest journey on, um, is around aligning expectations with stakeholders before you start a project. Um, so if you're a data or data science or data analytics organization is supporting the marketing team or you're supporting the product team um, or, or you're supporting the CFO on a project, making sure that their definition of success and yours, not, not only that you've got one KPI, but that it's the same one is really important. So I'll give you an example from a previous company that I worked at. Um, I was asked to create a uh, forecast. Uh, my team was asked to create a forecast for um, that, that forecasts um, multi-year revenue for each customer on a customer by customer basis. And so um, uh, some of the statisticians on my team uh, working together came up with a model that I thought was amazing. Um, I thought it was truly one of the most outstanding models I'd ever seen produced in my career. And I've uh, seen and, and managed uh, lots, lots of data scientists. So I've seen a lot of data science models. Uh, but this particular model forecasts four-year revenue um, for each customer on the basis of one week of data about behavior on the site. So with one week of behavior data, four-year revenue forecast. And it, we did some back testing and found it was 98.6% accurate. That's amazing. Off of four four-year forecast in the future, off of one week of data. Um, so um, my view of this um, was that this was a pretty outstanding accomplishment by this team of statisticians. It was so proud of them and super delighted. And I went to show the model results um, to our stakeholder for this project, um, who was the CFO in this particular case. Um, and he was actually quite angry, much to my surprise, um, because he said, why is it not 100% accurate? We should be striving for 100% accuracy. And, uh, and, and then he talked about the fact that in accounting, 98.6% um, accuracy um, is, is uh, potentially uh, problematic if you're audited, right? You don't want to be 98.6% accurate in counting your revenue, for example. Uh, you need to be 100% accurate for that. Um, but in data science, a model that's projecting four years out with 98.6% accuracy was really amazing. And this is where I realized I hadn't properly managed his expectations at the beginning of the project and brought him along on the journey of what is data science and what is possible and how is it different than accounting? Um, because it is different. Um, yes, I would completely agree that 98.6% accuracy um, if you're counting revenue is not acceptable. Uh, but in the data science world for a model four years out, that's pretty amazing. Um, and that all goes back to managing those expectations. Um, and to bringing stakeholders along in that journey and helping them understand both the amazing value that data science can drive, but also in a way that manages their expectations about what's going to emerge at the end of the project. So those are a few lessons that I've learned along the way um, in my time as a chief data officer and working within uh, data organizations. And I hope that you all enjoy the rest of the summit. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn to continue the discussion. Thank you so much.